Welcome back to Operator Syndrome. I'm Patrick here with Steve, as always. Uh, last episode, we were talking about uh, my first my first deployment um, to Iraq, and um, we'd previously talked about talked to Steve about his first workup in the teams and his first deployment, which ended up being to the Philippines, a very eventful first deployment to the Philippines. Very interesting. Um, so we're going to wrap up sort of my firsts. So, and, and of course, at the time that I went, 2006, it was a little out of order. I, I did not get a workup. I did not get a training cycle, as we referred to it then. Um, I, I graduated from RIP. Uh, I spent about three weeks on Rear D uh, there at 3rd Ranger Battalion, and then I got sent forward with a group of folks to, to plus up the, uh, the platoons that were, that were already deployed overseas so uh and i got one whole mission in <laughs> I, I think that was the big takeaway from the last one yeah uh and i was very excited about that so uh now i'll talk about the the training cycle what a, what a workup would be for a ranger again back in those times put this in context so for me um we got back the first thing you do is you take leave. I think that's pretty standard. Well, what really happens is there's this sort of weird period. As soon as you get back, you probably work for another week or two. You actually don't go anywhere uh, in your downloading equipment. You, you've sent, you know, bags and, and connexes, shipping containers full of equipment. And now you've got to get all that back in and secured. So that's what you're really doing for a couple, a few weeks once you get back. Um, uh, you come back and you're receiving new guys. There's always new guys sitting there. And I was very glad not to be one of them. Yeah. I, was very, I was very glad to be uh, uh, slightly, sl slightly more seasoned than them, although they didn't know it. Um, yeah, turn the uh, page yeah. on that one. <laughs> Got very lucky. Um, so uh, you're, you're downloading your stuff and then you go on block leave and that's two-ish weeks, something like that. And then the training cycle starts. So... I'll, I'll talk about I'll talk about in general what that training cycle looked like, um, which was uh, at the time it I, I would when I was listening to the SEAL workup, it sounded like it it's if I were trying to characterize it, it seemed like you were trying to hit. It definitely seemed environmental was like a big sort of thing, like different. Uh, it sounded like different ways of infill, so different ways of, of infiltration or getting to the objective area seemed like a big thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it also seemed like the envir environmental training was like a big part of it. Yeah. For for the Rangers, the training cycle was a very clear graduation in terms of complexity, complexity of operations is how I would describe it. So you would first start off when you came back from block leave and you started to get back into the training cycle, it would start off with individual skills first. So you'd go... Um, and by the way, when you came back, usually there was like a big shift, right? So you come back from a deployment and now there's a lot, a lot of shifting going on. Folks are going off to ranger school. You got folks who are, who are moving from one type of team leader to a, a leadership position to another type of leadership position. You got new guys, squads are, are sort of morphing and all that. So you start off and you're doing like individual marksmanship. You're starting off with that. Um, and you're working up to one of the first big events is a squad. I think it's squad live fires. So squad live fires would be in your squad or ranger squad is, is based on a traditional infantry squad. So it's um, you've got two teams of four and then a squad leader. So nine total. Uh, although in my time there, we barely ever were at full strength. Um, most of the time teams would be like, like two or three. Um, just because of the pace of the operations and kicking people out and people getting hurt. Like we were just never fully manned yeah. um, and back in those days. Um, some, so you do the squad. And, and, and I think it was at that time also that you did have some individual training that happened. So if you were a new guy, it was something really boring. Like you'd go to, I'm not kidding, a bus driver school because... <laughs> Because we would need, you know, if you went to go to a range or something, we'd take a bus, like a yep. bluebird bus. And so we'd send some private to bus driver school to get a bus driver's license. Sure. Right? sure. Um, but but as you as you 
and, and most of the time after you went to school, you went to ranger school and got your tab, right? There's, you're at sort of a, there's a stratification there. You get to go to a, a much cooler schools. So there was um, surreptitious entry, um, which would be like how to break into things, buildings, mm -hmm. cars, hot wiring cars. Um, That's cool. There, yeah, there was uh, shooting schools, of course, like every kind of cool uh, whiz bang shooting school, both military and non military. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were driving schools, off road yep. driving, like <clears throat> defensive driving, like James Bond style driving. Yep. Yep. Um, and one that I got to go to, well, I'll talk about, I'll just, I'll talk about this first. So this first training cycle, I'm a new, I'm like kind of a new guy. So I'm starting to get into the, the area where they call senior private uh -huh. is what they used uh -huh. to call it at the time. So you're a private, but you're not, you're not like a new guy who is a horrific, horrible person that you don't want around and you want gone. Right. You've kind of proved yourself so you can relax a little bit. Um, and then they, they, they treat you a little bit better. I got sent to striker driver school, uh, during that first training cycle and a striker for those who don't know, is like this armored, it's like this eight wheeled armored personnel carrier type thing, infantry fighting vehicle, something like that. It's not a Bradley, which has like this big gun on it. It's mostly just a troop carrier. Yeah. Um, because during the wars we yeah. were Rangers would sometimes use these armored yeah. carriers to roll around in. Armor so I got, carrier. Yeah. So yeah. I, I got to do that that first training cycle. Later on, I would go to a knife fighting school. And I was like, Oh, there cool. we go. Did you go to underwater knife fighting school? <laughs> no, no luck there. As a ranger, never. If I'm underwater, the only knife fight I'm doing is trying to get my gear off, cut my gear away to get back to the surface. Right. So so I'll talk about that more in detail because that was interesting. Not something I'd I'd exactly planned on going to, but it was a good time. So uh so all that to say you're doing a lot of the individual skills so individual marksmanship and then you do the squad level so your squad that operates um and then you're going into so you do those live fires and then you go into platoon live fires so a platoon would be um three three assault squads yeah. and then one weapon squad um and then the what weapon would, what would a, oh go ahead what would a weapon the, squad? So consist? the weapon squad would consist of again at that time it was three gun three gun teams. So uh, three M two forty. Well, it depended on what you wanted to take and it and what you what weapons you used depended on the situation. But we yeah. had the traditional M two forty Bravo machine gun, which is a great gun. And then we right. also had because we were you know we were in special operations, we had a a sort of beefy version of the saw called the Mark forty eight which was essentially a 762 version of the saw squad okay. automatic weapon. So at your time were the M60s just phased out? Never seen only seen M60s in the in the museums. I'm sorry, Steve. Well, that makes me feel really <laughs> special since I was a 60 gunner. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. And how many guys you know in the army, mm -hmm. this is what was always interesting like comparing and contrasting we we had us one guy carried the m60 which is your 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 belt fed machine gun at, at my time 7.62 millimeter it's a pretty formidable weapon mm -hmm. um and uh but in the army it was a crew served weapon which mm -hmm. meant i think three guys carried, like one guy carried that big base plate thing and another guy carried rounds and another guy carried the 60 mm -hmm. what about for rangers yeah, I mean, we, um, in, in that res with, yeah, with that, res with, you know, in, in that respect, um, we, we followed sort of the traditional infantry. And, and I'll also say that it, it does somewhat depend on the company you're in, the platoon you're even in. But by and large, what I saw at the time is we adhered to very standard infantry tactics for, 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 for utilizing a uh, gun team. So it was a, it was a gun team of three. You'd have, We'd have brand new tabs, um, would brand new people who had just come back from ranger school um, would would be a gun team leader. Um, you'd have the gunner who would carry the 240. Um, in we're in our in our com in our in our platoon, the gunner was not the team leader. The gunner was one of the privates, and mm -hmm. then we had an ammo bearer who was also yeah. who was also the, the who also carried the tripod. Okay, so, so yeah, we we would operate as 
and and that was sort of the, the name of the game i would i would be a gun team leader later it was a lot of fun actually to be quite honest um, but the other just to make clarification for my sake mm -hmm. not for others uh so your gunner is it going to be the guy that operates the 240 right. the other guys that are on the crew would they just have m4s also yeah yep. yeah they they'd yeah. have they'd have rifles and uh the the team leader would be they i mean you could almost think of it like a, a spot like a sniper spotter type situation so the yeah. uh the team leader would be like the spotter for the uh -huh. gun Gotcha. Um, and then um, the the ammo bearer would would emplace the tripod, and then the ammo bearer's job is just to keep the gun working, yeah. changing barrels, right, right. Uh, feeding the ammunition up to a certain point. point and the gunner's yeah. job is just to you know fire. <laughs> take the slack out, fire, hit the thing we're we're trying to hit. So yeah. And one other thing too, um, I'm I'm trying to catch because I realize we have a lot of, of listeners, or or I don't know about a lot, but we have some listeners who are are, are just totally non-military, which is awesome. That's that's part of what we're hoping to do. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, and I almost blanked out on what I was going to clarify. The um, what was it you were saying? Oh, spotter. Yeah. So for those listeners, we use the word spotter uh, in the sense that um, you have a guy who's usually got a scoped device of some sort. There is now when you're in a sniper pair or sniper team, traditional sniper team, it's two guys. And this, this is going back to old going out on stalks with two guys. You got a primary sniper and a spotter. And usually they're, they're both trained and they can do the same thing. <clears throat> They've been to the same school. Um, and your spotter is a guy who's looking at through what is actually called a spotting scope. It's a, it's a, it's an enhanced little telescope uh, uh, optic device that can, uh, it has a wide field of view. So you can zoom in and you can like, you can adjust to see like focus in on something, but you can also see the big picture because the sniper or the shooter it, depending on the distance you're shooting has a relatively limited range of, of view in that sniper scope. I know you can dial right in, but you can't see the bigger picture. So the spotter's job, and this is pretty much really the same job, even if it's a cruise, if it's a, a belt fed versus a sniper rifle is to just get the picture of what's going on and get that information to the shooter so he can engage or, or whatever. Right. And in the case of a, of a cruiser belt fed weapon, you've also got, you've got smoke, there's debris, yeah. there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of, it's all that stuff. And then some stuff in addition to that. And so, you know, in, in, in our platoon and our weapon squad, when I would go on to become a, a gun team leader, um, we chose to do those traditional tactics and we, and it, and it worked well for us. Mm -hmm. Other platoons might work it differently. Other platoons, they decided that the gun and, and in the Rangers and in the infantry in general, we put a high, we put like a high, what's the right word? Like uh, we prioritize casualty producing, high casualty producing weapons. So, you know, the, so some platoons would decide that, well, no, I want my team leader actually running the gun. And of course, hmm. Um, that, that might also depend on how they were doing it. If they're using the Mark 48, you know, overseas, Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, mm -hmm. that might make more sense. So it, it depended, it depended on a lot of things, but that's how we chose to do it. Tell them what the Mark 48 is. Well, so yeah, the Mark 48 was the Mark 48 was the, the 762 version of the squad automatic weapon. It was supposed to be, it was supposed to be lighter. It was still pretty heavy. Um, supposed to be lighter. Um, but, and overseas, a lot of folks would would choose to carry that one yeah um, the 240 is really heavy was if i remember correctly the 240 is definitely heavy but i always liked it because i i just felt like yeah. you know the, the saw fun. and the 48 i felt like everything rattled too much yeah. you know and the 240 i just felt like was just nice and tight, well yeah. manufactured and tight and it was heavy but it was like beefy you know yeah I mean? so, yeah I, I started to see those when i was on my way out we mm -hmm. They started, they were phasing them in and we still had 60s, but, um, and I, I love the M60. I just want to say I was good at that thing and I could hit, I could hit lights out at 400 yards and I could do, I could pull off single shots of that thing and hit kaping, kaping, kaping all day long at 400 yards. Now that's a serious, 
you could keep a lot of people at bay for a while if you've got cover with one of those but anyway um so but yeah yeah sorry um, i didn't mean to derail you no you no you didn't i'm i'm actually thinking in my head that i, I may have skipped forward so i don't th- Platoon live fires may not have been at that time. So again, it's a graduation in complexity. So first you're doing, actually there are team live fires and I didn't say that. So you work as a team. So a team leader and your three, three, um, three folks on your team. So you'd have a, a automatic, you know, someone with an automatic weapon, someone with a, 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 a grenade launcher, a 203 at my time or whatever it ended up being. Um, and then you'd have uh, just a regular rifleman was often loaded down with uh, a skedco or a stretcher something like that lots of equipment all that so you do team live fire then squad live fire you see the progression i think you did something with the platoon but at a certain point we transitioned from live fire activities which are on traditional one-way sort of ranges um there might be some kind of objective objective there i think somewhere in there you're doing team clearing like room clearing and then squad sort of house clearing. Um, but then you're, you're moving up to sort of the bigger training events in the training cycle at that time, which would then move into, um, we called it fixed wing for short. It was also called uh, airfield seizure. So oh yeah, airfield seizure is a big traditional mm-hmm. ranger mission, which yep. is, you know, you've got, um, you know, you've got a conflict somewhere. One of the best ways to get a foothold is, you can storm the beaches with the Marines, or you can have uh, paratroopers fly over behind enemy lines to capture airfields to help create an air bridge to help right. start to feed you know, your, your troops in. So the, the airfield seizure is a traditional Ranger mission. They, I think you know, the other airborne, tra- conventional airborne units also train in that to supplement, but it's really a Ranger mission to do that. Yeah, big time. Um, yeah. And so you would start off with a company jump, a company version of that. So your company now is three platoons plus enablers. So you've got a whole bunch of other folks that you you'd work with overseas who are starting to gather together to start to mm-hmm. train up with each other. And the first thing you do is kind of this, you know, very basic airfield seizure mission. It's um, it's You're not talking about in the neighborhood of 100 guys. Right. Well, well, plus enablers, you're probably looking at like two over 200, over wow. 200, maybe under 300. Right. Wow. Um, if you're if you're at full strength, then that's always the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full strength. So you'd go to do this this company size objective, um, and uh, I mean, try to. I'm trying to think of how I would describe an airfield seizure. You know, in some ways, it's very simple. The idea is to fly over, not get shot down. Not that, not that those of us in the back have any control over that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. To, 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 to jump out, to hit the ground. And, uh, you know, in, in, in real life, when airfields have been seized and they've been, it, the, you know, the capability has actually been used a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. There were even airfield seizure, seizures that happened uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, yeah. So um, some were more contested than others, but they've, they've, it's a capability that's been used. Sure. So traditionally, what you'll see is people know that the Rangers exist. People know that if I'm if I've got a fight with the Americans, they're going to come after our airfields. Oh, yeah. So they do a lot of work to try to prevent us from taking the airfields. They'll they'll um, put obstacles on the airfield. They'll obviously put uh, anti aircraft mm-hmm. things there. They'll do a lot of things to dissuade us from attempting to do it. And so you know. You know, once you jump out, the whole objective is to get that airfield clear, to, to clear, to create a perimeter, to prepare for a counterattack, yeah, and, yeah. and, and to, to, to start. And then for the Air Force folks, when I was talking about enablers, for the Air Force combat controllers and other folks that they got that are part of that team, the airfield seizure team, um, you know, they're looking to create that air bridge to get pump in more, more personnel and equipment to help expand the perimeter and push out to, to be able to secure that airfield. So, like I said, in some ways it's very simple, but uh, yeah, from, um, from <laughs> but from a from a planning and execution perspective, <laughs> and not and not killing each other and not getting <laughs> run over by an airplane, like Dude. there's a lot of things that go into it, and and you do it so much over the course of your career in the Ranger Regiment mm-hmm. that by the end of it, you're like, okay, I, you you get it, and that's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be like muscle memory, but there is a lot that's going on there. Yeah, and another thing too is, and I'd mentioned this in I think two previous episodes, 
there was a disastrous event in, during Just Cause when we invaded Panama, where they, they dropped a SEAL platoon, which is just 14 or maybe 16 guy, I can't remember, probably 14, to take an entire airfield, and they got a bunch of people killed. And the first thing we were all saying is, why in God's holy name was it that a ranger company mission and um you know you get into planning and boy it went down in the lessons learned book i'll tell you that but we had no business not near enough guns and we we didn't even train for that operation really so we were all just like what what on earth were they thinking but yeah you, yeah you, you learn from your mistakes hopefully but yeah that's a classic ranger mission yeah 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 it's been, you know 14 you know 14 guys i mean come I on mean, let's say let's say they had 50 guys i mean yeah. that it, that that's very that, that that would that would make no sense to a ranger because everything we do is just based on overmatch just overpowering yeah, overmatch a, you know a good strategy <laughs> <laughs> so um so you do the company mission then you do the battalion size mission so now you've got so now you've got all three well, eventually we'd have four four line companies assault companies you got the mortar platoon you got battalion recce you got you know, now it's a much bigger thing. And now you do that. I think over the course of that, 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 that training evolution between company and between the company jump and the battalion jump, you do, man, how many jumps is that? Because you got to do a refresher too, mm -hmm. because back in my day, you were deployed, you'd be deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. So you got to, when you come back, you got to do the refresher jump, but also it's for pay to make sure yeah. you keep getting paid. Yeah. Um, you know, you'd probably get like, five jumps in the matter of in a manner of you know static line static mm -hmm. line jumps for us in the manner of uh you know a month maybe yeah. a month or two month and a half period i think if i'm remembering correctly forgive me internet if i'm wrong but <laughs> um but uh, and then and then and then these are not fun because you're you're intentionally attempting to land on a runway so yeah. Like there, it, it, it hurts. It hurts when you're static line jumping and you land on the pavement, the asphalt of a runway or a taxiway. Guys have landed on aircraft that were on the apron. Um, yeah. I, I wasn't at one. I'd gotten out of one because that's my specialty, yeah. but I'd gotten out of one of the, one of the, one of the uh, fixed wing uh, training events. And I heard a guy, it was an airfield in South Carolina. And uh, he'd landed on an F-16. Like oh. things, things can get, and he tore something, tore something sensitive. So like, you know, it's not <laughs> fun. It hurts. I I've landed on the airfield and it's just like a shock through your body. It's just pain. Um, it's not even fun if you're landing in the sand in the desert, much right. less on tarmac, but yeah. Right. So that, that's a tough one. Um, that's a big one. And then you go into, and then you get into, um, uh, we call it TFT. And that was the, really the last big thing of the training cycle. And uh, we TFT for task force training. Now this was training that was more on an, more with an eye on validating the units, the platoons for deploying overseas. So uh -huh. whereas the airfield seizure mission was just kind of like, a, this is, this is our bread and butter. This is, if there's a national tasking that comes down, you know, and we need to do a forcible entry operation somewhere in the world. We got to know how to do this because this is what America expects Rangers to do. That's that piece. But but in the training cycle, it also serves that purpose of like knocking the rust off, you know, yeah. and getting units used to operating in larger and larger. Then you shrink back down to platoon. Yeah. So the TFT training was platoon focused because you're going overseas. The the, the stuff you were doing the 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 um the ranges you would use now when i say ranges you would think of like a traditional shooting range outdoor shooting range we also use that terminology uh synonymously with you know urban urban fighting you know sites and all that kind of stuff and so for tft you would do um there were lots of little events so you'd have to do the um uh, helicopter familiarization so you'd have to work with, you'd have to go over to the, uh, the 160th mm -hmm. uh, Special Operations Aviation Regiment mm -hmm. to go work with them. You'd have to do... Um, would you go to Fort know, Campbell to do that? Or would you... We do, would go to... Yeah. to you? We'd yeah. go to Fort... Well, sometimes it, it depended on where you were doing it. 
there were times where they came to us and there were mm-hmm. times being in third battalion where we would go to Fort Campbell. <clears throat> My guess is the guys in Savannah since the 160th has folks stationed there as well. Yeah. They just pair up with them. I'm not quite sure how that works, yeah. but as part of the TFT, you do like elevators, right? So elevator oh, yeah. for folks who don't know elevators are like, you just go up and down and you're practicing fast roping, you know, getting on and off just very basic things. Um, yeah. And one, one thing too here uh, that, because I'm trying to do a better job at de-jargonizing. Uh, and we mentioned it briefly in the previous episode, I believe. There, oh no, two episodes ago, pa- Patrick asked me when we were rehearsing to go into <laughs> Fast Rope on a Skyscraper, if we had 160th. Okay, so now, just for a little information, there are tier one flying units out there. Okay, and, and 160th is one. Uh, army and they are they are the best pilots in the world they're amazing they're the best of the best they're like the top gun of the helicopter combat pilots and they fly all kinds of gunships little birds we'll talk about some of this eventually they fly chinooks they fly the the you 60s uh, blackhawks right, the blackhawks and and they all these and they're so good at it and then there there's an air force group that i need to mention called first south first special ops wing and they're out of florida and they fly these amazing birds called 50 they fly chinooks ch they're they're like they're called pavlos um and they're mm. they're really advanced aircraft they've got the 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 electronics of an f-15 <laughs> a fighter but forward-looking infrared all kinds of comms they can do everything and then they have pave hawks which are the the black hawk version of of the special ops and they're really good and then their gunners are good and um so there has been a lot of controversy when one of the biggest the largest casualty in, in in naval special warfare history was they were not being flown by 160 or first sow and that was the first question that started to float around why the hell were they flying and it's a complicated answer, but just to get back, I just wanted to say those are the those are the top two units for hotshot flyers that we always wanted to be with if we could. Mm-hmm. Definitely, I'm. I, yeah, I in my time, I I never needed to work with anyone else, so <laughs> I was I was spoiled with that regard. I I didn't know anything else other than when I went to Ranger School. There, when you go to Ranger School, your airlift is student pilots, and I could definitely tell a difference. Just mm-hmm. in like the wobble and the shake and, <laughs> yeah, and the, everything and the additional fear that I had. So uh, you do that TFT mission, the TFT mission. So you do the elevators because you may need to work uh, on helicopters. But you also and I, I can't remember if the type of infill platform depended on where you were going. It might have. I don't remember it that way. I think that you had to do everything. So yeah. in the conventional military, you have you have paratroopers you have air assault folks and air assault is just air air mobile or people who ride on helicopters and you've got units that are mechanized or or strikers so people who ride on vehicles well the ranger regiment is not restricted to any right. one type of info we do everything so yeah. if we want to ride on armored vehicles then we'll drive our own armored vehicles thank you if we want to do a helicopter infill we'll do a helicopter infill if we want to ride on boats we'll ride on boat we do whatever we want or need to do or jump in yeah or jump in right so all those things um so as part of the task force training you would have to prove that you could do that you need to be validated that you could do those things it's one thing to say yeah we'll do it but then you got to prove you can do it so we already proved we could jump into an objective check right with airfield seizure then you had to prove that you could do the the helicopter infills and uh and drive strikers or whatever else you might need to do and uh and the tft training at the time was always very focused on you know, kill capture missions for high value targets. Um, so, you know, it was very much uh, looking, you know, you'd have an objective, you go to the object, you're looking for, you know, a specific person or persons, um, you you infill to the objective area, find the person or persons, and then get out of there and, and, and do it again. So that was, and then after that training, um, then you'd, you'd have cleanup period. And by the way, Along the way, there were breaks built in. Um, some may, maybe not enough breaks. It felt like, but there were sort of breaks and holidays built in there, and rest periods between the big tra- uh, big training events. Uh, but after the TFT mission and you were validated, then you would 
get block leave, and then you prepare to go overseas. And, um, and that took the place of, you know, the rest of the army would do these big joint, would do these big training events before they deployed, you know, JRTC um, and NTC. So these are big, like, if you, anyone was in the army, they'd know these things. These are training areas in Louisiana and California where uh, conventional units would do these big, long workups, but we didn't have the time to do that just because on the cycles we were on. So our TFT was our validation exercise, and then we go overseas. So what of, of uh, in your opinion, I have an opinion about this. I guess I'll state mine first, but I'm not tr trying to in any way influence, assume, influence you or assume of all the things you trained to do. D okay. This actually opens up a larger question. Did, when you were doing urban warfare, mm -hmm. like we did urban warfare, there's, there's a couple versions of it. One is like you go to Fort Hood and they have these, these mock-up cities mm -hmm. where you go through and you have aggressors and you shoot and move and you move it, you know, you move at angles and you try to, you know, whatever assault. And then you, we had what's called CQB close quarters battle, which was room to room indoors in a kill house. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> that is like more surgical in nature. Mm -hmm. Like it, it tends to be, you know, th this is a total, I, d I don't know. I, this, I might be making this up or, but it seems that Rangers are more moving like Black Hawk down, like cordoning off, setting up blocking positions. And then you've got tier one guys going in and doing the real, like room to room, getting the high value target a lot of times, like breaching and going in. But did you also do, do breaching and, and clearing room to room as well? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. What, what the, okay. So then that, the, okay. That's, then my question is, to me, that was the hardest, most stressful thing we did. Live fire, kill houses. What, what was the most stressful thing you did in all of that workup? Well, you know, honestly, I, for me, I mean, the stress, there was a lot of stress all the way through. Um, I really did not like the airfield seizure part. I, I really did not Step enjoy jumping. I, I, I never enjoyed jumping. I, I actually found that a lot of Rangers that I knew felt the same. Like I never felt the type of dread before doing an event like <laughs> I did before jumping out of a plane. I just never got comfortable yeah. with it. Never liked it. Yeah. Now, now we were doing the uncomfortable static line jumping. You've got all this gear on you. You're coming out the side door. Like all the all the procedures and ceremonies before you jump, just amp up more and more. <laughs> yeah, you know, just amp, amp it up more and more. So I never enjoyed that. You know, the room clearing part was. You know, again, I was like, you know, I was of the video game generation, and yeah, like, okay. You know, that was we the room clearing stuff was the fun stuff. Yeah. Okay. You know, you're it, yes, you don't want to mess up, and no, <laughs> and the stakes are high. You know, yeah. you don't want to shoot somebody or make a mistake and get in trouble and kicked out. But um, you, uh, that was the fun stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was fun too to me, but it was also, we were graded very, very carefully on that, man. If you made a bad shot, you could be out of the platoon or something. Or, I mean, if you did it more than once or something like that, it was, mm -hmm, right. just, it was always, and, and that's the thing that I've heard from guys at Green Team at Dev Group. I've, they, the question is, okay, there's two, the two tier one units, the, the army side, CAG, and then dev group. And the question is always, what's the hardest part of that selection? And in, in what I've always gotten from the CAG guys is insane land navigation. I mean, just brutal land navigation. Not that there's not other hard stuff. Right. And at, at green team, at dev group, it's always insane CQB, like high, high stress you've got to be on the nuggets, man, one bad shot, you can be out of there. Um, but and and but in the difference of the parachuting, I totally get it. Because for Rangers, yeah, they're jumping on hard tarmacs. And it, you hit the ground like a sack of potatoes with those round static line shoots. And you got all this combat equipment. It's never fun. And you always kind of brace. But in, one of the advantages we had was we, we, we would jump a lot in the water. Uh, and that's just like, well, you can jump off a high board and be fine. You can hit as hard as you want. It's like, woo, yay. Uh, it, it's easy. And I love jumping in the water because you didn't, 
your legs weren't going to potentially break in half. And then we would jump square shoot. So with square shoots, you have a lot more control with those, those round shoots. You have a very slow forward movement. And if you've got wind and you're turning into the wind, you could end up anywhere. You really don't have that much control. Right. Um, and squares, you can guide them a lot more and just in flare and just tippy toe landing. You right. don't even fall down. It's sometimes, sometimes you do, but well, it, it definitely hurt. It wasn't comfortable. <laughs> okay. And we're out of time. Thanks. Next video. Uh, okay. We're going to talk about stolen valor. So <clears throat> we'll catch you all in the next one. Thanks guys. Bye.